Auzubillahimineshaitanirajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamu alaikum viewers I am your host Faiza Nakwi with a prayer May Allah keep you all safe, healthy and blessed And may Allah hasten the appearance of Imam of our time And may Allah make us true companion of Imam uh, Companion of Imam of our time Inshallah, Ameen uh, Today the topic we are about to discuss in May Pishan Is a secret of uh, secret soft power war against Islam Which is uh, a, a long time uh, it's, it's been a long time since this is happening and uh, we are like uh, seeing the outcome and results and uh, results of this war on uh, our civilization on our education on our everyday life and uh, how the uh, this war is uh, 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 this war has been working on us and what kind of tools these power have uh, to bring that uh, war upon us because you know uh, every nation or in or an, an individual which uh, stand by their own values and their ideology if we lose our ideology if we lose our values we lose our uh, very existence so this is something which is happening and this is what uh, is we are about to discuss in further details. We do have a uh, pre uh, prestigious guest with us and I'll move on to our guest and we'll try to understand uh, what tools these um, powers have uh, to use against Islamic ideology and uh, Islamic values and uh, how they are working uh, in everyday uh, like uh, life and what kind of uh, uh, actions we are supposed to take in that uh, regard. We do have uh, uh, brother Sayyid Mohsin Abbas and we do have uh, uh, Sayyid, uh, we do have Ali Salam from Basira, uh, Basira Pre uh, Press. Uh, thank you so much uh, Mohsin Bhai. I am really honored to have you on the show and really grateful for Ali Bhai for your uh, presence as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for uh, Muslim, how would you describe this war first of all and how important for us to understand this war uh, because we have been talking about uh, this issue in like number of times in different ways but obviously sometimes we do not pay attention to these topics seriously so the moment or the time we are like going on at this time so how important it is for us to understand this thing and what is this all about well, uh, I think uh, it's probably the most vital area of life in terms of who we are and where we're going that uh, gets neglected uh, and is probably underestimated by the average person on the street. I don't think it's underestimated now by states that are affected by what I call uh, essentially um, uh, it's the uh, hegemony of knowledge. Uh, you know, knowledge is power. This is a very common uh, um, notion that we have is almost a little affordable that we, we throw around very casually. But uh, in 96, 1996, Joseph Nye Jr., a, a chap called William o o a. Owens, who were writing for the Foreign Affairs, the U.S. Um, think tanks uh, articles, they, they talked about knowledge being more than ever before uh, power, the, the one country they thought that was the uh, best place to lead that information revolution would be... Um, the United States. So information technology and the age of information, of course, has has uh, rocketed uh, in exponentially in uh, in those recent decades during my lifetime. And now we're at the stage where, you know, the development of information technology has got to the point where it can uh, access us anytime, any place, anywhere, virtually with the internet and the other various gadgetry that goes with it. So that has made information and soft power uh, even more, of course, powerful. Uh, it's, it goes hand in hand with things like military power, hard power, you know, uh, those kinds of notions of dominating uh, nations with armies, etc. Now, uh, can't really be done effectively without also controlling information. And I think that uh, uh, this, I think, is something that was recognized, and I'm, I'm trying to look at it from two other perspectives. One is uh, the, re the religious and the spiritual perspective, and the, o the other, of course, is uh, for those people who are committed to justice and who uh, are very committed to fighting for the oppressed, because it's the oppressed who are treated most unjustly, it's the oppressors who often uh, take up information technology as a means of oppressing them 
even further. So, of course, it has a great bearing uh, on a religious, moral, and um, you know, ethical basis for us as Muslims. We have to be very, very interested in what information technology is about, what this knowledge hegemony is about, and we ought to be having a very powerful uh, set of narratives, uh, an ability to, to tell uh, our story, uh, the ability to dream and imagine a future which is Islamic and religious and just and ethical. And uh, we do that all the time anyway as human beings because uh, human beings think in metaphors. We, Our brains work in a way where we put up a series of uh, images in our minds in, in, in order to make sense of the world. It's images that are going rapidly through our brains which are, which are then processed as as, uh, as language, etc. So that's very important. How we think and what our emotions are when we think is a very, very powerful tool. And I was uh, watching um, a little documentary briefly last night which talked about Edward Bernays, uh, who's the father of modern psychological operations, essentially. You know, the idea of information wars, information technology, uh, it, you know, the, 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 the soft power being used by the people in power, the ones who perennially controlled money, for instance, to be being, being the biggest benefactors of this ability to to um, get into people's minds with ideas and, and with with controlling these metaphors that go on in our brain. And of course, uh, the means they've used it for over the last decades and even before, of course, are, are many, you know, nowadays, the obvious ones are the tools of, as I've mentioned, the, uh, the net, the dark net is something we don't even want to necessarily touch here, but things like Hollywood and Bollywood, for instance, as film industries are manifestations and are also used within this narrative and storytelling. For who? Uh, the Americans, as I mentioned, but the Americans themselves are also, in, in the grand scheme of things, just a tool, a kind of a, a nation or a state, an imperialist state, and a, a set of, uh, which has a set of boots on the ground and military hardware that it can use to keep uh, the people in line if uh, all the other, other ways of controlling this don't work. So. There are clearly neoliberal uh, ideas which are packaged into stories and, and metaphor, which is then penetrated into society as part of soft power, and it's used for the purpose of political, economic, and uh, you know social control. And in fact, everybody is impacted by it. There is nobody who's not affected by it, unless you're living completely on a mountain without even uh, any contact with the rest of the world. Uh, and of course, Islam... Uh, is in a war because I'd say that the primary assault of this of this medium of control of society, this soft power, this kind of storytelling, this uh, narrative creation, uh, and this this monopolization of knowledge, or the effort to monopolize knowledge, uh, it, it penetrates the political, economic, cultural, and social spheres of every person on the planet. But Muslims, in particular, are being hugely damaged by this, and uh, we have internal forces which have help to, to, to confuse us, and we have the external forces as well. Uh, I'll go on to those. I'm going to mention the, the Wahhabi movement, for instance, as one example. Um, the secular neoliberal movement as another example, which has been a challenge to Islam's dream and, and the notion of, of creating uh, a future which is truly just based on divine divine rules and regulations and laws and, 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 and culture. So I think it's an extraordinarily important topic, and uh, it goes past people. I will go into examples perhaps of how we did it in the past. You know, the uh, Alif the Shayu, for instance, have all sorts of iconography. To, you know, they have uh, tazias, they've had all sorts of ways of commemorating uh, noble uh, individuals like Imam Hussein al Islam to remember, to tell our story. You know, the whole Noah Khani, the Marsiyas, the Azadari, all of this is really part of soft power. This is. Uh, Shia Islamic soft power in many ways. Uh, there's much more of it, but I'm just hinting at the areas that perhaps we can touch on uh, later. And of course, I've mentioned the tools and I've mentioned the mediums by which a lot of this soft power is attacking us. But we need to first of all understand that we are in a war because people often just don't recognize that there's any kind of struggle going on. Mm.
thank you so much mohsin bhai uh, ali salam uh, have you heard uh, mohsin bhai and uh, what are your thoughts on the topic we are discussing today uh, regarding secret soft war uh, which we have and are we really understanding this war and are we doing uh, something against it obviously we'll go uh, uh, on this part uh, later on but first of all it is very important for us to understand uh, what areas do you think are really important in this war and as uh, brother Mohsin has mentioned some parts like uh, uh, education or knowledge against the knowledge you can say like manipulating things and taking institution in their own hands in different ways so what are your thoughts on this topic and uh, how would you uh, like uh, reflect uh, how important it is for us to understand this Bismillahirrahmanirrahim first of all I like the premise that uh, Sayyid Mohsin presented that uh, on the one hand, we should identify the soft war against Islam. But if we only focus on that, that's kind of just only paying attention to the negative aspect. And at the end, he brought up that we should focus on our own soft war capabilities to promote divine values, to promote... So it's like a positive. It's not just like being against something or identifying how much we're being fought against. We also need to identify uh, our roles and responsibilities to counteract and counterbalance that. Uh, but we can, uh, I think to first start, we need to understand the negatives, perhaps, and then uh, in the later segments of this uh, uh, talk show, we can hopefully try to come up with a few suggestions. Obviously, we're limited in our knowledge and in our capacity, but we'll come up with some, some perhaps some suggestions that people who are more knowledgeable than us, have more skills than us in the area of software, can uh, feed off these and expand upon our ideas and add to where we have shortcomings. So I think the soft war against Islam uh, is really a soft war against the fitra of the human being. It's designed to humiliate the human being. It's designed to take the human being away from a true life, a life of dignity, a life of true, truly fulfilling their purpose, which is to serve Allah and to uh, be righteous and upright and dignified and not corrupt and not living worse than a, lower than an animal as far as their nature and their actions are, and behavior is concerned. So we can say the software goes back uh, for as long as mankind has been on, on this earth since Nabi Adam because Islam is a natural religion. Maybe there were other languages, uh, holy languages that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put on the earth other than Arabic, such as Aramaic, Hebrew, Syriac, and all these other languages. And they're all very similar. They have these root words, like Islam is from a, has a root word like, which other words can be derived like Taslim, Salam. And so in these other languages, we can find a similar root word that's the equivalent of the one that's for, for the word of Islam. And we can find the same thing in these other languages. So, but the, the essence is the same as submission to God. That's what Islam means. So sh Shaitan and his allies have always been uh, hungry for power. And they've been the first ones to hoist themselves into various influential positions within the human society, whether in very simple, simplistic societies or in very advanced, well, so-called advanced, at least technologically advanced, not morally advanced, as our current society. And they are the first ones to try to take these centers of power so they can use those to harm and manipulate the physical bodies of human beings as well as the, the souls of human beings, actually perhaps even more so the souls of human beings. And that's especially where software uh, takes place. So the the war against the Prophet Muhammad and his family has been happening since uh, the beginning. We have the instances of Muhammad taking over the even the seats of power within Islam like Bani Umayyad and Bani Abbas and they would change a hadith uh, and they would insert their own hadith using scholars that they paid off uh, in order to uh, fulfill their own narrative some in the, in the immediate term, and perhaps some left for the uh, maybe hundreds of years later. Perhaps even the, 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 you know, according to the actual hadith and what we can research about history in both Sunni and Shia sources, for example, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, was uh, above the age of 18, perhaps early 20s when she married the Prophet. Who knows, maybe they put this fake hadith that she was now was a nine-year-old child when Islam forbids child marriage. Uh, it requires both mental maturity and physical maturity uh, to, to, to get married. Um, 
that they put that hadith into the corpus of narrations in order so that hundreds of years later, when it comes time to slander the Prophet Muhammad, there's one extra tool to slander the Prophet Muhammad with. Um, so that this is the, this is the beginning. Now, as we go on through history, um, the enemies of the of the Islam know that there's going to be a time when Imam Mahdi returns and Nabi Isa returns, and they spend a lot of time studying our hadith and our teachings and everything like that. Perhaps even more than we do, and they believe in it in some ways. Perhaps more than we do, although uh, in, a, in a negative belief, like they actually want to fight against it. A true belief would mean they actually accept it as the truth. So they, they are preparing for these scenarios and they kind of are building the world and preparing various technologies and world events uh, for these types of scenarios. Um, and and they're, they're basically preparing for the end times and they're trying to essentially bring it on. They want to increase bloodshed and corruption on the earth. Every value of Islam, which makes the human being upright and dignified, they want to turn on its head. For example, the... Uh, and this is something that has been mostly put forward by America. As much as other regimes have been blood-soaked and tyrannical, they didn't upturn the natural order of things in the way that the American regime has. For example, the culture of boyfriend and girlfriend and illegitimate marriages and premarital affairs, that kind of existed in Europe after the Enlightenment when they abandoned God, when they threw away Christianity, they threw away the Church, and instead they embraced Freemasonry and the Kabbalah and everything like that, and liberal values. Um, yes, there was illegitimate relations, but America normalized it as a culture. They made so many movies where it's like boyfriend, girlfriend, prom night, all these different types of things like that, and people having relationships before they get married, and now you have generations of children who are, who are basically illegitimate children of illegitimate children. Mm -hmm. Like their, their parents were not married, and they were not married, and it's just wedlock, born after wedlock, and then those uh, essentially illegitimate children then have even more illegitimate children. And it's not like this phenomenon didn't exist because we you know that the oppressors of Ahl al-Bayt were illegitimate children, like Ibn Marjana, and even Yazid, and Muawiyah, and like all these people, yes, they were born out of illegit illegitimate children, but those were the, the very uh, degenerate behaviors reserved for the elites of a society. The average people of society were uh, very bound by their families and everything like that. Even, even the people who supported these regimes, they themselves were uh, bound by families because families gave strength to society and gave stability to the society and that was useful for the tyrants at the time. Um, now they, they are so fanatical and so ideological that they want to make the society reflect their own depravity and their own degeneracy. So uh, we know that for example, uh, um, if I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, according to some of our beliefs, uh, only an illegitimate child can uh, kill the imam either directly or indirectly through through proxy. The one basically the one who gives the order, or even sometimes the one who actually does the killing themselves, like Shimmer or uh, Lanatullah, or they are all these other different types of people. So that's just one aspect. I mean, there's so many facets, but that's just one aspect. We can go. There's millions of different aspects in the way that they've basically taken every value of Islam and turned it on its head to create a society where the human being's soul, which is designed to worship a lot, well, is designed to worship. Uh, it's designed to worship, and it can worship something, and it can worship something else. But it should be worshiping Allah to gain its maximum potential uh, f for goodness. But instead, it worships other things to gain uh, maximum potential towards wickedness. And that's just the war on the human soul. Now, when it comes to the war on Islam specifically, this war on the human soul also relates to that, because a corrupt society filled with illegitimate children will naturally view Islam as something uh, bad. And uh, that's where their soft war in the in the in the recent times comes into play. That mm -hmm. takes uh, place in the form of false flag attacks, like September 11th, which was carried out by the Mossad and the CIA uh, using controlled demolition and other kinds of uh, high-grade military explosives to bring down uh, three towers, uh, which were only hit by two planes allegedly, if they were even planes. And that's that's. Um, the, the, the political evidence is more concrete than the scientific, ev uh, scientific evidence because we can say, oh, were they planes, were they not planes, but we know who did it. And that evidence is very, very clear. Um, so that etched into the minds of Americans, including myself, before I accepted Islam. Uh, I was nine or ten years old in a non-Muslim family, in a Jewish American family, during the, the time that September 11th happened. And that was the first time I found out about Islam, I think, to begin with. And my first image of Islam was evil, wicked, people dying, 
bad things happening, um, you know, these, these types of bad things. So then they had their Hollywood, then they have Hollywood to uh, implement the movies that reinforce the uh, negative uh, outlook upon Islam that people have, that is reinforced by false flag terrorism, as well as the fake news media that, uh, for example, on, on the first days after 9-11, when it was reported that five Israelis were arrested on the day of 9-11, uh, across the uh, Hudson River in New Jersey, and a group of, uh, another group of Israelis who were arrested near the George Washington Bridge with a van full of explosives uh, that they were probably trying to uh, uh, carry out another phase of this false flag attack by blowing up the George Washington Bridge, and thankfully that was a tragedy was averted by the police, and they were caught as Israelis. Uh, that got buried eventually. The mainstream media reported on it, but because they were told to go along with the script and the narrative, they buried that story. And so uh, Islam has been under a series of various... Uh, attacks, really, especially since 9-11, but even before that, uh, with pr uh, predictive programming in these various Hollywood movies, like even the, the concept of trade centers being or hit, being hit by planes, or in various different movies, or for example, even things that your that your sub that your main consciousness won't pick up, your subconscious may pick up on, like in the movie The Matrix, where uh, the passport or ident ID card of the main character expired on 9-11. All these different coincidences. Uh, as well as the de de dehumanization of Arabs and Muslims in general, and that they're wicked and evil, and they only cause uh, uh, mayhem and destruction, and the Zionists and the Americans are always perpetually uh, innocent uh, victims. Uh, this was in the mindset um, prior to them. But then aside from like the political demonization of Islam, uh, Islam is as bad as a power, even attacking us as Muslims ourselves, attacking our faith, there is also a software. There's a software to get us to, as Sayyid Mohsen mentioned, to get us to be very um, deviant uh, in various different uh, reinterpretations of Islam, like Wahhabism on the Sunni side, or for example, Shiraziism on the Shia side. Uh, and then there's other deviations which uh, take us away from Islam entirely, like various secular and liberal ideologies, mixing in capitalism or Marxism or thisism or thatism within our Islam, especially within the West where youth go to universities and they're exposed to these different flavors of liberalism, what this flavor or that flavor, and uh, sometimes they buy into it, they think it's so cool, especially because some of these isms pretend to be our friends and our political allies, which is fine to an extent if they're generally our allies, but how, how often do our allies uh, of other religions and political ideologies, how often do they adopt wisdom from Islam? Almost never, but we're the ones who are always bending and adopting their worldviews onto ours to the point where it uh, takes precedence over Islam in our thought process and our worldview. So we end up supplanting Islam uh, with something else and grafting that onto, onto our ideology. So so even, even there's a soft war against our own faith uh, internally so that we become either very secularist and liberal or very like... Uh, uh, barbaric and going against the noble values of Islam, but in the name of Islam, like through Wahhabism and through uh, other for other sectarian uh, uh, deviant uh, ideologies. So the, the, we're being hit by all sides. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that shaitan will come with us from all sides. So whether it's the external angle, like them just attacking Islam as a whole and making it seem like something it is, it, some, making it seem like something it is not, or coming after, on the internal aspect, coming after our faith and getting us to get off the Surat al mustaqim and going to uh, something totally wildly different than what our faith is, uh, which ends up weakening us and weakening our power as an ummah and our power to unite, and our power to have faith, and our power to not be addicted to this world, and to not follow our egos, and instead to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is really a multifaceted war, and we have to be able to see all the different facets. Aspects. Because there's some people they may see one side, but they don't see, for example, the secular secularization aspect, or or some other, or they miss one side. So we have to see all these sides so that we can hold on to our faith and navigate properly, and then move on to, for example, fighting against it and offering positive solutions to these problems.
Thank you so much, uh, Ali. Uh, uh, you have mentioned so many important aspects regarding this war. Uh, Mohsin Bhai, how would you uh, like add uh, more points regarding especially the technology we are using and the industries we are following and the brands and stuff like that? Because there are so many important aspects uh, Brother Ali has mentioned regarding uh, spiritual war and the, how history has been distorted and manipulated against Islam and the ideologies have been created as you mentioned mentioned in uh, your point of view that uh, like the theism you can say if we call it like that like Islam against Islam and uh, Shiaism against Shiaism something like that so so uh, so they are working on every aspect they are stud they have studied Islam in depth and they understand the real values of Islam so in the past uh, they know the past they know the future what in the sense of uh, they like studied it well for instance and they now creating the system against the system we are going to have in future for instance you can say when uh, appearance of imam of our time uh, will happen inshallah soon so what do you think uh, what else do we need to understand about it and what kind of obstacles we need to create as a human being because what is a against Islam is against humanity as well it's not just that it's just Islam because Islam protect humanity and our innate nature obviously so how would you uh, uh, like uh, reflect some light on these aspects and anything you would like to add from brother Ali discussion as well yeah I mean I probably like to explore uh, the way uh, Islam is penetrated a little bit more and then perhaps uh, uh, talk about some of the, old, the, 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 the solutions to this. Uh, I think the first, first thing is really that uh, we have to recognize that the Holy Quran itself, um, it's, as a medium, it's hugely creative. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges uh, the people to come up with a verse like it. And he, he, can, he says, surely you won't be able to bring up a verse like it. So excellence in presenting your argument, eloquence, uh, creativity, literature, um, presenting your, your, who you are, what you are, in a way which is concise, which is sharp, which, uh, which also uh, is, is, um, is excellent. Uh, that's really important. And I think Muslims have slightly lost their way over the years on this score. Of course, you can see evidence of uh, Islamic excellence in history, you can see a lot of the architecture, for instance, and you can see the expression of spirituality within certain, say, the, uh, the architecture of Isfahan in Iran, or, or many, many other buildings. You can see that even the buildings, even the architecture, the art, the artists, they were very aware, even the rulers who actually commissioned these works, were very aware of, of the need for uh, a kind of, um, uh, a soft power theme which spoke to the people even in, in its most beautiful form and people were obviously when they would see the beauty of this architecture or the paintings or the, the various other uh, you know aspects produced by um, the Islamic hates around the world they will, people would see them and be in awe and would attribute them to Islam because they were they were in essence from Islam and you can you can see that virtually in all of these mosques and all these kinds of buildings and various other artistic creative outputs over the years. Um, even in the poetry, uh, the likes of even uh, people like Rumi or, or even the philosophers, everything had that spiritual focus and core and it, it was people striving to do it at its best. I think that uh, that has been taken away from us because first of all, the leaders of, the, of our time, the majority of them, other than the Islamic Republic of Iran, the majority of the nations that are uh, so-called Muslims are actually neoliberalists, dictators, despots, fascists, or, or, or uh, essentially uh, people who are uh, following heretical versions of Islam created by Anglo-Zionist imperialists. So we've got a problem because if your own uh, people who have most of the money and the power and the control of our commons are sold out, then of course they're not going to invest in artists and creatives or, or metaphor or imaginative people or, 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 or tell the story of Islam in the way that it should be told. And that's what I think primarily uh, we're suffering. The creatives don't get investment uh, in, in what they are and what they do. And there's not a, a striving towards excellence or presenting spiritual uh, realities. Our fitra, uh, as, as Brother Ali rightly uh, indicated, the human fitra is not being pushed 
uh, with the same kind of investment or the same kind of uh, level of skill that is now seen within uh, within the secular Western neoliberal uh, soft power uh, machine. And it is this industrial, it's a kind of a industrial media uh, complex that goes hand in hand with the industrial military complex. So we need to, we need to first of all. Uh, refocus and of course it's not just about produce reproducing the art of the old the old times because uh, the quran taught us to, said you know we sent the messengers uh, to speak to people in a language they understood so the language the methodology the narratives would have had to appeal to or, or at least penetrate the minds of the individuals they were touching i don't think we're doing that as, as muslims today we're not thinking about the audiences a lot of the time things that are being said or done or pushed in the name of Islam are usually about uh, power, ego and um, uh, uh, position or, or how we look to other people rather than the content and the, the beauty and the, and the effectiveness. So I think we need, we need a huge review about our investment in creatives, about the narratives that those creatives uh, drive forward. We need, uh, a, there you need, uh, you need almost um, hubs where the ulama uh, connect with the creatives. So whether they're techno technologically proficient young people uh, that are emerging, people who do animation, who are theatre uh, producers, who are filmmakers, who are video game designers, who, who make memes, who have uh, the ability to t uh, draft graphic novels, you know, any of these creative people in any field, you know, drama, uh, etc., they need to engage with the best of our spiritual teachers. And I think that that creative link between the scholars and the ones who have got stuck in, say, sciences and ethics and uh, law and spirituality and are more academic and bookish, those those madrasas, for instance, need to engage more with creatives, right from the day word dot. In fact, there's no reason why ulama can't be creative in that sense. They don't just have to be people who are bookish. Why, why not gain skills which allow them to communicate directly with the world, for instance? That sounds quite awkward, but you know, why can't, why can't an alim also learn the skill of, for instance, uh, graphic design or, 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 you know, making animations or being able to tell uh, or, or, or generate his knowledge in that way. And if, if they're not going to become it themselves, at least they should be hubs where these things take place so that we can produce new, um, new iconography, new, uh, new, uh, creative, uh, output and pr produce new uh, Islamic creative uh, messages that speak to people of the, of the time. You know, memes now seems to be one of the biggest things you look on Facebook or any of social media. People don't have time to read huge long books. And whilst I am an advocate of reading books, etc., the reality is that people's attention span has now been reduced to something like, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds. They'll go on TikTok and you've lost them if you don't say something they're interested in within five seconds. So you're up against a culture which has been deliberately designed to dumb down people with a culture which is still very bookish and scientific and wants to do all those kind of things. And I don't say we, we, we need to dump it. What I need to do is, what I say is we need to bring up a, a, a new range of ways of communicating with people, communicating the message of Islam and give them the alternative. Uh, and Palestine today seems to be evoking, I'm seeing stirrings of individuals who've seen the the, the power of the story of Palestine, the, the, the atrocities and the, the, the terrible, you know, oppressed uh, narrative that has come out uh, and they are converting to Islam. I've seen a, lots of videos now coming up where people are touched by the story of a Muslim people strong in their faith, uh, fighting oppression, uh, bearing up under the strain of losing children and, and having, having heads blown off because the story is very powerful, basically. You know, that narrative is so powerful that no matter how many millions and billions or trillions the, uh, the, uh, the Zionists or the Anglo-Zionist Empire throws at it, they're going to have a hard time stopping people feeling sorry for, for these individuals. So I'm not saying you want people well, to feel sorry for Islam. What I'm saying is that that literature par excellence, which came in, in the shape of the Holy Quran, needs to be projected in, in ever more powerful ways. And we need to wrest power away from the, the, the likes of the Saudis, for instance, who are basically a puppet for Anglo-Zionist empire. They were set up by them in the, in the early part of the 20th century, and they've continued to do their bidding. Uh, so much so that, I'll give you one example. Uh, just this year, uh, the Saudis have jumped up their investment, uh, foreign investment, in, by 22 billion 
dollars a year. It used to be 2.2 billion, which was, uh, which was, you know, strong enough in its own way. But now they've gone into this whole business of infrastructure, real estate, you know, and uh, mining, manufacture that they want to get involved in other countries to influence them to have soft power. That they're saying, if we invest in your countries, we want to have uh, guarantees that you will do what we say, basically. And uh, you can see examples of that in the past, where Pakistan and places like Indonesia have been buying into this kind of uh, uh, these kind of sweeteners, you know, and in, in return, what have they got? Indonesia, I'll give you one example, uh, is a victim of Saudi soft power, you know, Anglo-Zionist Saudi soft power, insofar as they also uh, only gave the money for building education institutions. So education institutions that Saudi sponsored were obviously going to be Wahhabi and Salafi and uh, pushing a certain kind of Islam. And it became so powerful, and it is so powerful, that it's now embedded in the culture and the, the mindset of the people, so much so that the political power of people like Suharto and all these others was was really quite limited by the fact that there were these huge, religiously super, uh, hyper-conservative, uh, her heretical uh, outfits that would, would basically not allow his largely secular neoliberal um, establishment to move forward because of the Islamic orthodoxy. Now, you had two evils, which Ali uh, focused on as well, I'd mentioned, that neoliberalism and uh, conservative religion, you know, fake, false pseudo-religion, as I call it, uh, those two are the ones which the uh, moneylender uh, powers prefer. They don't want real Islam in the market. That's why they have to suppress uh, real Islam wherever they see it, and, and true Muslims. So we've got this issue of, uh, you know, these, for instance, those schools, you know, they produce, they produce millions of kids, millions of kids who are indoctrinated by textbooks produced by the Saudis and there, and you know who's been producing those textbooks behind the Saudis, uh, it would be the same Anglo-Zionist imperialist uh, academics. They, produce, they gave them scholars, so they were trained scholars from other university, etc., who went there, and you had then, of course, this whole machine that was built, and that you can see how they then can control Indonesia uh, with basically soft power. They've done it through soft power. And I think exactly the same exists in Pakistan in many, many ways. And I think this is why one has to take this very seriously. And I think, you know, uh, our job, whilst we're not states, we have one state, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is investing in uh, uh, soft power. They are very aware of diplomatic soft power, certainly, and they've played an excellent uh, round of uh, diplomatic soft power, and as well as the, the military hard power, that's really kept them intact. But I think that there's far more that we can do, and even, even I'd say, suggest Islamic Republic of Iran, because we have a rich heritage. Uh, the Ayama Masumin give us that heritage for creating the most excellent of, of soft power. Imam Zayn al Abidin's poetry, you know, the sad poetry, or his, his, um, his his uh, his eulogies and his kind of uh, eloquence, which ran throughout the Imam Masumin, um, was something they, they consciously did. It was a creativity which they were using to put across the message. Uh, as a Zainab Salam with her uh, with her whole oratory, but from the point of Yazid's court onwards, entire life she spent as really a, a soft power agent uh, to promote. The, the true Islamic message, and they were so successful that the imperialist Umayyads and the Abbasids successively could not destroy real Islam. Real Islam remained amongst the grassroots on many, many levels, uh, whilst the, the establishment was essentially imperialist uh, uh, warmongers and killers and, and conquerors. They were power-hungry people, controlled probably, I would say, by the same same kind of uh, money-lender forces that uh, controlled most of the uh, British Empire and the, the subsequent US Empire, which we're having to deal with now. So I think enhancing Mankabat, Kamali, talabat e quran iconography, but doing it in languages which speak to the people of the, their areas, doing it with excellence, being really ruthless with ourselves about producing that excellence, creating uh, institutions which produce young people that can do all of these things, especially uh, to, to the Western audiences where most of the power and the knowledge economy now thrives, but also thinking ahead to China, because China is the new the new pet, I rather suspect, and I rather fear that China could be the new, uh, uh, you know, uh, power which the money lenders invest in, because we know for a fact that they always play everybody off. They'll uh, for instance, the Rothschilds, we've discussed in this program before, did it by embedding themselves in Frankfurt with the with the Prussian Empire, with the with, for instance, the British Empire. You know, here in, in the city of London, they embedded themselves. They had themselves set up, of course, in uh, in France as well. And there was there was uh, uh, basically a, a fanning out all across Europe, and they controlled 
those uh, colonial powers, those colonial empires, through money and through the, the, the agency that that gave them to create narratives and to produce uh, certain themes, to engineer wars, and then to profit from them as well. Now, that's a, a game which has been played from time immemorial. Muslims need to wake up to this in this era, and on a grassroots level, you know, as, as parents, well, what can you do? The soft power you're facing is exactly produced by the think tanks and the media and the agencies of secular neoliberalism or, or uh, fake Islam. So you, you're going to have to fight tooth and nail because the only way you're going to stop that entering your uh, children's minds and overtaking them before they've even formed their opinion about Islam in a proper way is by being very hands-on. You need to have your own curriculums. You need to uh, circle your children with the ability to, uh, you know, explore, be creative, be able to think, uh, to be able to rationalize, to be able to problem solve, uh, to be independent thinkers in many ways. But at the same time, also give them yourself, give them that history, that, is, that Islamic history, in the most creative, the best way you can, uh, uh, until, of course, we produce that level of of iconography and, and soft power, which we can use automatically. But you can go on the internet and you can find good material now, but you have to be with the children, especially at a young age, to be able to guide them and to show them mm -hmm. historical aspects of Islam, to show them the cultural aspects, the, to show them the beauty of the literature, to show them the, 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 extent, the, the extensive nature of our sciences and our, our eth in ethics and morality and, in, and also the medical world, you know, the herbal remedy side of it, you know, to open up a new kind of uh, uh, vision and dream, which is far more in keeping with the prophetic dream. This is what soft power should be about. Uh, unfortunately, our attention is rather stuck in, in, in the past, and everything we do is uh, basically uh, reproduction. Not saying that you should cancel all of that, but we do need to look again at all of our, um, our iconography, as I say, and all of our manifestation uh, of Islamic um, uh, creativity and, and the, what was produced, we have to re-look at it and we have to see always constantly update it and upgrade it and not just uh, do it for the same old market. There's a big world now that the technology gives us access to, we should use it. Thank you so much, Mohsin Bhai. Uh, Brother Ali, how would you uh, like pinpoint, like there are so many important aspects uh, uh, Brother Mohsin has mentioned uh, regarding education system, political system, how things are being twisted and uh, manipulated against us. Uh, through our own hands, you can say, like, obviously, if uh, the theories are being, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, organized and taught in our own madrasas, in, for instance, in, like, in Pakistan, if if madrasa is funded by Saudi, so we need to understand what it would teach, and we have seen the uh, so many kind of uh, uh, results after uh, these madrasas have been working from past so many years and all that, so how what if we try to create the list of the things we need to work on especially in political side economic side education side and the media side and the industry we uh, are engaging with so how would you uh, create that list and what areas we really really uh, how creative we need to be and uh, how we should uh, counter these things uh, back uh, if we say To switch to the positive side of things on the solutions angle and what we can do to counter these things, I think a lot of it actually rests in our own hands and there's a certain degree of self-sabotage when it comes to these matters. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with mental colonialism uh, as to why there are so few artists among our people, among Muslims and believers. Um, when the British and the Americans and the French uh, came to this re to West Asia and South Asia and many other regions, they, after some time, they realized that brute force colonialism will cause revolutions, will cause people to become upset. Too much oppression keeping so many, uh, so much of the population poor uh, would eventually lead to backlash. So they eventually decided to create a middle class, and they did that through creating universities, uh, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but they, it ends up creating a class of people who are who have titles that they can brag about. So it becomes like a way to fuel our arrogance and ego and a stick powder and everything like that, and makes people a lot of money. Maybe not so much money that, uh, but but it basically keeps on this middle level where they're happy, they're content, and they're comfortable with the system that is ruling over them. But they don't have enough money or power to be in charge of their own country's affairs. 
So they, they it's like uh, comfortable enough to just shut up and stop protesting or revolting, but never uh, at a position to have enough money and power or influence to actually uh, have a sovereign independent country. So we've kind of taken this mentality towards our parenting, the, the prestige, all oh, money and power and titles when it comes to being a doctor or engineer, all these other different types of things that, uh, especially when it comes to getting married or buying cars or buying houses, different types of that, different types of things like that. For example, if someone was to come to your uh, daughter for marriage, uh, if there's two different brothers who came to propose to somebody's daughter for marriage, one had a PhD and the other one was an uh, artist, for example, a skilled artist, who would, they, who would the parents naturally agree towards? With the mental colonialist mindset, they would gravitate towards the PhD. So this idea that nobody's successful unless they have a PhD, this idea that I'm not going to let my daughter marry anyone unless he has a PhD, that people in our communities don't aren't allowed to even speak in the masjid or organize in the masjid unless their title is doctor or muhandis, is a very toxic mentality. And it's not to say we shouldn't have doctors or engineers. And honestly, to be honest, we have a surplus of them. We have plenty. We're not going to lose out if maybe 5 or 10% of our youth go towards the arts and become skilled at it. And they can do, for example, a double major. Because, yes, it's many times it's not always the most money-making endeavor. So they should have a fallback, for example, being a doctor or being an engineer. Uh, why can't they be both? Why can't they have a artistic skill and then some some regular career to fall back on in case it doesn't work out? Uh, and they can always do both at the same time. They can do the the regular career for the sake of money and do the artwork vis a vis la. So unfortunately, this is attitude amongst parents, uh, attitude amongst people who, when they're trying to get uh, married, they're only preferring people who are these kind of middle middle managers of society, which are needed, and it's not to downplay doctors or engineers. But we have to encourage our youth to seek arts. We have to support them. We have to make sure that they are skilled. And those who aren't skilled, they can try different. If they can try different areas of arts until they find something that they like. Or if not, if they are not skilled at art, if they're not create, creative at all, they should uh, use whatever money they make from their careers to finance those who are uh, skilled in these in these arts and. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that we aren't doing this, and so we have a natural shortage, just of people, uh, just in, uh, as a matter of numbers. Then we also have a shortage when it comes to vision, like what to do once we have, whether we have these numbers or we don't have these numbers, what do we do with them? Uh, we don't have an alternative to Hollywood. We could easily have an alternative to Hollywood that's just as powerful, uh, as say, also mentioned, like kind of like a hub, which produces like these, that's what Hollywood is. Hollywood is a hub where all these kind of uh, disparate artists and writers all kind of like coalesce over this one center and they get fun funding and finance and they all, it's like a full-time job. People have a vision to spread these things all over the world. They're very militant and they're, we can be, we can have a similar uh, outlook and a, and a similar vision. We can have a, uh, a Islamic uh, counterbalance to Zionist Hollywood uh, that produces high quality films in many different languages around the world. Why, why, unfortunately, the liberal uh, reformists of Iran wasted the past eight years with Rouhani Alhamdulillah. Finally, we have someone like Sayyid Raisi who's, who's finally uh, using his time wisely. Um, but still, there's still perhaps some middle managers with this very, very uh, liberal mindset who, who are always going to think of themselves as inferior to America, that Iran will always play second fiddle to America, and we will always be inferior to America, and we can never think of ourselves as the leaders of the world as the thought leaders of the world, as the cultural leaders of the world, as the people who, who the world copies us instead of copying uh, American culture. And we can do that by establishing these alternatives. Why not alternatives, for example, people who may maybe not skilled in the arts, but are skilled in technology and coding and things like that. They can create the alternatives to uh, Twitter and Facebook and all these other very controlled Zionist social media platforms where you get deleted and your account gets suspended if you post anything of the, of the truth. And there are some apps like that, like Veracity for like a Twitter alternative or various different to alternatives to WhatsApp and, and Telegram. But even when they exist, they're not supported and bolstered so that they become like a global norm and that people around the world use it as an alternative to the very uh, suffocating censorship on these Silicon Valley platforms. So we really need a vision to be able to have the self-confidence to see ourselves as a civilization. 
America is not a civilization. It's kind of like an anti-civilization, but it has the kind of power and far-reaching elements that a civilization has. And so we need to see ourselves in being in the same position where we surpass America. And we surpass even burgeoning uh, superpowers like China, which, as Sayyid Mosin mentioned, uh, has a positive and a negative element depending on... Uh, Brother Ali uh, just to remind you about the time we have just... Uh, you just have three okay. four minutes about uh, to conclude uh, your point of view. So last three, four minutes, I would like to give Muslim Bhai to conclude his point just in case. You can continue, it's fine. You just have four minutes, it's fine. Oh, sorry, sorry. So I'll just, I'll just finish up my thought. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, the, the leader of the Islamic Revolution has, has basically put forth a plan called the second phase of the second Re of the Islamic Revolution. And it's basically envisioning uh, our Islamic Ummah as a civilization. And that's beyond the kind of the very limited nation states that we have. It's a kind of a uh, it's, a, it's something that's very vast because we, we don't have civilizations really so much anymore. They've kind of been annihilated by the nation state and uh, the money mafia uh, has essentially used these small statelets to create wars and strife amongst human beings so that we don't ever kind of uh, unite amongst our commonalities, whether ethnic or religious commonalities, and have powerful civilizations that produce positive outputs for the world and have re relative states of stability and peace and interact with other civilizations on a basis of mutual respect. We can achieve that civilization. The Islamic Republic of Iran can transform from a nation state to a civilization state. This is a conversation that's even, uh, it's not taking place among Muslims, unfortunately. I think it's a lot to do with the mental inferiority and the mental colonialization. But this conversation is even happening amongst uh, some political circles in Russia, for example, beginning to see themselves as a civilization state rather than a nation state. So why can't we, who are the possessors of the purest form of divine revelation have such a big vision. And when we have that vision, then all these other things will follow through. The establishing hubs for artistic or technology generation that end up uh, serving our soft war, soft power aspirations in the positive sense to help humanity and elevate people's souls rather than to harm humanity and, uh, and drag people's souls down to the fires of uh, hell and ignorance and corruption. Thank you so much. Uh, Brother Mohsen, we have like four minutes if you would like to con uh, share your conclusive remarks on that. Yes, I mean, I agree with everything uh, Brother Ali's put forward. It's uh, common sense and it just seems very logical, the, the direction, the trajectory we're pushing. But yet that common sense sadly seems to be lacking largely uh, with those people who invest in so-called promotion of Islam. Unfortunately, uh, we need to get out of this mentality uh, of, of just doing the same old, same old. I, I just think that the problem is that the people who've made money and who become very wealthy and who can then become patrons to promote religion, they themselves, unfortunately, haven't been given the creativity or the kind of the, the broader analysis of Islam and, and a holistic version of it. So therefore, they then re-replicate the same things that they've, they've already had. So even well-meaning people who reinvest in religion or in, in Islam or, or the faith of uh, the, the fitra, uh, in Sani fitra, they, they end up making the same mistakes. I think we need to break out the phase, and it doesn't matter whether they're, they're literate or illiterate. The fact is that, that if you're illiterate about spirituality, and if you're illiterate about the depth of, um, uh, of your own religion, then you won't be able to uh, really be uh, the kind of patron that uh, can make us 21st century durable. And I think that they need to take a back seat. There's a little ego that we need to let go of. And uh, just as they do when they manage uh, businesses or become successful as managers in, on that level, they don't do it themselves. They do it through uh, the people they employ. It's a team. It's a team effort usually to make a make a, anything successful or make any project come to fruition. In the same way, if they looked at Islam in that way, if we pooled our resources, recognized our own limitations, um, st started promoting those people in the community who can project the soft power for us, which is, uh, you know, it doesn't have to always be super financially invested. You don't, to make one Holy Hollywood movie these days can take anything up to 120 million uh, pounds, maybe more, you know, and then they know they're going to get a return. Okay, well, you can't go to that level. We don't have that sort of money. But what we can do is still the power of simple uh, messages can be just as effective if they're very, very creative and if they tell the truth. Because the truth has its own power and it has its own 
own kind of magnetism. And Islam is truth, Quran is truth. If you present it in an honest way, which has a, uh, you know, isn't straight-jacketed, uh, isn't sort of dry, isn't just uh, limited to the, the, the kind of rules and regulations which are all based on trying to minimize uh, doing anything wrong. I mean, I think that there is a suffocation of creatives that goes on because of the parameters that are often uh, placed upon them. And I think uh, people need to start looking definitely at the law and looking at uh, our kind of interpretation of Islamic law with regard to creativity and how far it can go and what its parameters are. Uh, the moral and ethical uh, norms and, and balances, of course, have to be maintained. But there are, I mean, not so long ago, I remember the Saudis used to say even having a photograph was haram. You know, it was bidda to have photography. I mean, they don't now, but the, the fact is that kind of mentality, that kind of psychology still exists within, within the Muslim world and it stifles a lot of our, our creatives. So I think we need to we need to challenge our own our own understanding of Islam by becoming uh, more well read. And once you the deeper you go in and you realize that the wealth of creativity that emerged, uh, you know, just in the sciences, for instance, because, uh, you know, it, it's not creativity of the sort that uh, we think of traditionally with uh, with films and videos, but actually science is a hugely creative exercise in itself. And uh, Jabir bin Hayyan, you know, the, 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 the prodigy of Imam Jafar of Sadiq al-Islam, known even now as the father of chemistry or father of sciences, you know, they were thinkers. It was because they were creative. They could think out of the box and they were encouraged to do that by the Imam and they were given license to explore and, and seek new ways and new, new truths. I think we need to have that spirit reinvested within us to say we can take this challenge that Imam Khamenei has put forward of creating a civilizational, Islamic civilizational vision or a future which is civilizationally, uh, divinely, uh, uh, divinely uh, rooted and inspired. So I, th I think it can be done. I think people need to wake up to, you know, putting their investments in the right place, dedicating their uh, next generation partly towards being creative as well. And I think the ulama can get involved with scholars on different levels and even uh, scholars who are not religious science scholars. They can all get together with creatives to, uh, to, to really uh, revive uh, a kind of an alternative uh, Islamic dream, which it can, and it can be, you know, everything from herbal remedies through to sort of lifestyles, mm -hmm. through to how we make our houses, through to the kind of uh, the whole, uh, the, the natural way of living that we, we might be able to institute. There are so many areas which are, which are there to be explored, and in the West, people are stirring in that direction, but being suppressed. So, uh, you know, our society, not more than say about 50, 60 years ago, we're still farming in a, in a sort of a, on, a, on a, a region, on a local basis. But now we have corporate farms coming in which have destroyed our food, so our health goes down. So you can see what we're talking about in Islamic civilization is not just some religious hocus pocus notion of creating hegemony for is, uh, Islam as a movement. It's actually for the health and for the, 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 the psychological and the, the, the physical well-being of humanity as a whole. So it becomes uh, something which is an uh, absolute necessity, not something we can just, uh, you know, do uh, very lightly. We need to invest heavily in soft power, we need to invest heavily in creativity and to produce narratives and produce, reproduce the dream that the Prophet had of creating a civilization which was divinely rooted on this planet and not just wait for Imam Mahdi to come and do it for us, but the whole point is we should be striving towards uh, delivering that, that, that civilization ourselves, regardless of what, uh, what happens at end of times. Thank you so much, uh, Sayyid Muslim Abbas, and thank you so much, Ali Salam. I'm really honored to have you both on the show for this important discussion. And obviously, as uh, you both rightly said, we really need to go back to our roots and we should work. Uh, creatively and we should uh, definitely uh, serve Imam of our time before they appear or we shouldn't be waiting for them just uh, doing nothing but we should be waiting by creating that atmosphere that is required for that time uh, to come inshallah so I'll take a leave today uh, on this point that we all get uh, together and work hard towards the uh, vision of Imam of our time and create that atmosphere that bring creativity knowledge wisdom and uh, true principles of Islamic values in our uh, lives, in our civilization, in our politics, in everywhere and in every sphere of our life. Thank you so much. Allah Hafiz.